good day, ladies and gentlemen. Today, uh, we are going to dis discuss the cup blue glass uh, production uh, function. Right. Uh, this is an overview of the session, and uh, these are the details things that we'll be doing. We'll be treating this cup blue glass function into details. Recall that we talked about a production function, various characters of this production function, and if you take the cup blue glass production function, it's a specific production function. And what we will be doing is that we would be looking at all the, what we discussed under the theory of the frame, and then knowing that the Kobluka uh, Kobluka's production function is a specific production function, we will try to investigate how the function, you know, behaves. Now, the literature is the same. Now, this Kobluka function is of the form that we see over here where k and alpha, k and l are raised to the power alpha and beta, you know, respectively. We believe that, you know, alpha and beta are fractions, a is greater than zero. So v is uh, the quantity of physical output and all the other sort of uh, variable are as defined over here. What we would like to know first is the marginal product. So we will try to look at the marginal product of the Kobler function with respect to one of the inputs, let's say L. So when we take the marginal sort of uh, uh, the first derivative with respect to L, we get this, okay, which we can simplify as this. But notice that what we have standing here is the same as the function here, okay? So what it means is that instead of having this one, we can put in the same function, right? So the marginal product of capital is obtained by just multiplying the function by alpha and divide by k. So if you want to know this function, the marginal product with respect to k, you just look at, you know, multiply the same function by alpha and k, and then you are fine. Similarly, we can have the marginal product of labor, right, which can be given us, as we have over here, the same function and then b multiplied by l you can convince yourself by differentiating this function with respect to L and doing the usual substitution that we have done over here. Now, the second order derivative. So we know these are the first order derivative. This is the first order derivative with respect to K. So we can go further and take the second order derivative. And when we simplify, we get this. And again, you see that we can substitute what we have over here with a V and then we have these uh, equations, okay? So the second order derivatives gives us this value or the value that we have over here. Now, the negative means that, you know, the law of the diminution, diminution returns is satisfied by what? The Cobb-Douglas function. Analogically, you can do that for, for the, the, the uh, cross partials, okay? And I'd like you to take your time and then, you know, take the cross partials, we are going to get this, right, this, and then when you simplify in place of this one, you put the same function, and then you have that. Now, what is the nature of the cobb douglas you know, function? It means, is it a concave function or is it a convex function? To be able to do that, as you know, we have to form, it's a function on two variables. You recall that we, discuss concavity and convexity using the Hessian determinant. So it means here too, we have to use the Hessian determinant. Earlier, we have found the first, second order, you know, partial derivatives and also the cross partials, which that is what we've done up to date. So you just insert, so this is the first order cross partials, uh, sorry, partial derivative with respect to K, with respect to L, these are the cross partials. So when we insert them into the Hessian de determinant and then we simplify, we get a function of this nature, okay? We can factorize this out and then we also simplify it and we get an equation of this nature. So the question is that will this value be greater than zero, less than zero, or equal to zero? And it's from here that you'll be able to know whether the function is concave convex or strictly concave or strictly convex. Now, these are the conditions under which you are going to get a concave, a complex function to be concave or a complex function to be what? Convex. So once you are able to determine, right, the value of alpha and the value of beta, it will always 
I'll help you to know the concavity or the convexity of the function uh, once this equation has been, you know, determined. Now, what is the nature of the isoquant? You would like to know whether the isoquant, again, is concave or convex. So we have a function here. We said isoquant is that is the combination of input that yields a specific level of output. So if we assume that our output VO is K, uh, it's, uh, it's constant, that is VO over here, then we can express K in terms of what? L. When we take the first order, you know, derivative, we get this. And when we take the second order derivative, we get this. And if we have these conditions, that alpha being a fraction, L being greater than zero, then we have this one being greater than zero. So this equation becomes, you know, greater than zero. And then we know the nature of that, you know, isoquant. Analogically, we can do it for L. And then we have this one. And then we have, so what it means is that for a Cobb-Douglas function, you know, we can have the isoquants to be what? Convex. And that permits us to use it very well in many analysis. Now, the elasticity of substitution, which we talked about, there's a formula for elasticity of substitution, which we discussed last week, right? And uh, in that equation, we had F1, F2, but here we are changing with V1, uh, VL, VK, just for comfort, right? So this is our function. If we change the K to uh, X1 and then the X2 to L, we have this function. And uh, if we take it that, these are the differentials of the Cobb-Lula function. And then we ins insert them into our elasticity of substitution function, which is here, right? We insert all the first order, the second order into the function. The values are here. And then we evaluate, we get one, right? So what it means is that for a Cobb-Lula function, the elasticity of substitution is equal to one. I would like you to go through this activity, take this function, we call the function constant elasticity of substitution, and then try to, you know, investigate the function, the first order, the second order, and then find the elasticity of substitution of this function we have over here, which is a specific, you know, Cobb-Lugas function. So here the alpha and the beta has been given, and uh, you, need ha you need to play with this, uh, uh, function. Having discussed the, you know, this Cobb-Lula function, what I would like us to know now is to discuss the optimizing behavior of a firm, okay? In a neoclassic far firm, the firm technically solves, you know, five sort of problems. The first one is output maximization, which you may have come across. We have, you know, cost minimization, we also have profit maximization, the, and these are all more or less unconstrained optimization. We have output minimization subject to a fixed sort of cost. And uh, so also do we have cost minimization based on, on a specific production quota. So in all these discussions, you may need to know whether you are going to use constrained or unconstrained optimization to solve these uh, problems. And uh, here, I provide one example here where a certain company has got this function and uh, we are supposed to find a level of, you know, output that maximizes the firm's profit. So it's a straightforward function. As usual, we go through that first order differentials. You know, we talk about our bordered, our Hessian determinant. We evaluate them, the principal diagonals, and then we get a maximum to be what we have over here. So what I'm trying to do is that once we now know our Hessian and our bordered Hessian, we have to apply them to five sort of problems that any neoclassical firm you know, faces once we know the nature of the production function, that it, it satisfies the basic conditions of a production function, then we can do some maximization. So the example over here is also here constraint optimization which as usual and here is applied to a specific firm and then you can know how to you know discuss that so you can take your time and uh, go through this solution 
and I have some activities here for you. Now, what have we done in this section? Some activities here, very nice questions that you can solve. If you have problems, we are going to meet at the chat room and uh, we will discuss it. So try and be at the chat room. There's also another question here, right? These are very nice questions talking about the new classical behavior uh, optimization problem of a friend. Thank you very much.